everyone, and welcome to episode 22 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. The medieval period is routinely slammed as a time in which people had little to no medical knowledge, but the people of the Middle Ages had a much better understanding of how to heal themselves than modern popular culture would suggest. A lot of medieval skeletons show signs of old injuries, sometimes very serious ones, that healed well enough for the person to have continued on with life. So how did they manage it? They turned, of course, to nature, using what they had on hand, including items we often categorize solely as food, such as honey. Using honey for medical purposes? Sweet. This week, I spoke with Dr. Alana Krug about the use of honey in medieval medicine, especially in a military context. Ilana is an associate professor of history at York College of Pennsylvania and the author of work on everything from military medicine to complaint literature. Here's our conversation on honey, military wound repair, and that time Henry V got an arrow in the face. Hi, Ilana, and thanks for joining me today. I'm really happy to have you on the podcast. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I wanted to talk to you because you were doing some research, you are kind of a military historian, and you found that a lot of times people will store up honey in castles and on their military campaigns. So why would they be storing up honey? Well, my contention is that a lot of the honey that was being used and stored in castles for use by the garrison and any kind of army that might muster there was for medical reasons. When I started looking into the history of honey and how it was used historically for all kinds of things, everything from helping to embalm bodies and preserve them in ancient Egypt to treating facial scars and gout and headaches. And people in antiquity had a huge amount of different uses for honey. But the one thing that they tended to use it for, maybe not the most, but something that has been demonstrated to be extremely effective, even in modern medicine, is for the treatment of wounds, which of course is something that we, you know, find on medieval battlefields. So that is the kind of focus that I was working on when I was looking at why honey might have factored into a military context. Honey actually is kind of a miraculous substance. First of all, of course, it never spoils. So you can keep it without any kind of preservation for however long you need and only replace it when your stores get really low. Generally, honey creates a barrier against bacteria penetration, and it creates a sterile environment in which a wound can heal. Part of this has to do with the fact that there is naturally occurring a small amount of hydrogen peroxide in honey, and because it also has a relatively low pH of 3.5, so it makes it kind of acidic, it makes it too toxic of an environment for microbes. So all of these kinds of attributes to the substance meant that it could be used directly on wounds, you know, festering or otherwise, to create a sterile environment where germs and everything could not get in, could not proliferate, and as a kind of continuous antibacterial environment, it allowed these wounds to heal. Clearly, honey would be something that you could tote around with you when you go off on campaign. And that made it very valuable for, you know, medical use in a military context. As a result, I believe that these are the kinds of uses that honey would predominantly be used for when we see it in the context of castles, especially in the amounts in which I found them. They seem to be relative to other kinds of substances or materials that would have been used for creating beverages. You know, malt that was used for making beer, and of course, all of the wine that was used and imported. 
you don't find enough honey being stored generally to you know make it practical for creating the amount of mead or any blends like sizer which is cider and mead together that would have been enough to supply either the garrison or an army on the march so probably not for beverages and most of the time when we think of it in provisioning accounts for military use, we're looking at very basic foodstuffs, grains, dried fish. We're looking at a lot of basic things that can be taken cheaply uh, and, and sold to an army very easily for the basic substances. You're not really going to see people saying, oh, I need to put some honey on my heart attack. You know, it's it's not the kind of thing where you, where you would look at that and say, oh, they were probably using it for sweetener. People used honey in the Middle Ages for a huge diversity of different medical uses. It wasn't just take a bunch of honey and slather it on a wound. It was often used as a binder mixed with a whole bunch of different herbs and other ingredients. Sometimes it was used that way like a plaster or an ointment. Sometimes it was added to other kinds of liquid ingredients that could be taken as like a tonic. So finding honey in castle stores, in my mind, it was less about the consumption and more about the medical uses that everybody in the Middle Ages knew honey had. So when you talk about there being kind of a massive store of honey, but not yet quite enough to make uh, mead and other things like that, is this a big enough store that honey would be used for many people's wounds or would it be kind of reserved for the elite wounds that you would have on a battlefield or in a siege? I imagine, although of course the documents don't exactly say this, but if we're talking about having honey on hand, to be utilized for wounds. It's not really a matter of who has access to the honey as far as elite versus non-elite, but who is actually going to be administering any kind of medical care. And generally in the Middle Ages, basic kind of medical attention could be dealt with, you know, like first aid, mostly by the soldiers themselves. Sometimes we see in documents, including literary texts, indications that knight squires were sometimes expected to have those first aid ingredients or even to stitch up their knight's wounds at battle. But when we're thinking about the access to surgeons and physicians who would likely be ordering certain other ingredients from apothecaries we don't necessarily see a lot of that coming into an official capacity, these armies, until very late in the Middle Ages, 15th century. There are a couple of cases where we'll see people taking their surgeon or their physician to battle with them in earlier centuries, but there didn't seem to be really a sense, at least on the part of the, the military leaders, the kings, of making military medical aid in, in terms of really skilled practitioners available to the rank and file until you get into the 15th century. So who is really going to have access to that? Well, probably everybody will have at least some way of getting honey, but it's a matter of whether you know what to do with it. <laughs> That's so true. That's so and, true. You know, I mean, in some cases, it really is. Put some honey, just as it is, on the wound. That's why even today there are bandages, like a band aid, that are infused with honey on the pad. And that is all it is sealed, of course, into the bandage, but that is what is put on a wound. It's just honey. It's it's nothing else. None of these other ingredients that would have required the apothecary's aid. And I would think that it would be something that would be 
not easy, but relatively easy to find when you're on the march. You could find hives at, at a monastery or something. You could find a hive in a florist or something like this. It's, you can collect it on the march, which is also very helpful, as well as taking it with you. And as you say, it's still useful today. It's still as useful as it was back in the day, which is great. Yes, yes. And it seems that Manuka honey, particularly, has become all of the rage. Everything old is new again, right? <laughs> I guess so. Although Manuka honey does not come from Europe, so they would not have had access to that. Well, that leads me to my next question, and that is, when you were looking into honey, did you find evidence of people storing it for what you think of as military use across Europe, or was it kind of localized to certain areas? My research that I had conducted was really focusing predominantly on the records that we have from England. And while we can say here is one indication that there was honey stored in this place, and here is another indication of honey being stored, there is no clear-cut evidence apart from just a few examples of honey being actually used for medical care in those military contexts. So, you know, you sort of have to take that leap of faith, that logical jump and say, well, they had the honey and they used it in military context. Here we have a military situation. They probably had access to it. They probably were using it. So although half the time, when you take a look at the surgical treatises and some of the records from the Crusades, for example, they might talk about procedures that they are using as far as stitching up wounds or dealing with serious cases, but they don't usually say what kind of substances they're using for that kind of care. You sort of have to assume well, if they were going to be doing this, they probably needed this kind of equipment or these kinds of medicines or tonics in order to do that. And then you can go to the medical treatises and say, well, what were they using for those kinds of wounds or illnesses or conditions and see, oh, they often used honey. So you can kind of make that connection. And we do have those kinds of treatises that are, of course, translated generally into Middle English. Sometimes you have a huge amount of Anglo-Norman records, but you also have a lot of Latin records dealing with the use of different substances for different medical uses, including wounds that were all around Europe. So just because my particular research focuses on the English records. I probably would hasten to say that that kind of information was also available to people in Italy and in France and the Holy Roman Empire and in Spain so that they would have known what to do. They probably would have used it. I just haven't looked at some of those areas. Yeah, I would agree with you on that, that even though the section that you looked at was English history, I think that it's it's totally logical to assume that this kind of thing would be common knowledge uh, across Europe because of the type of treaties, treaties that we have, of medical course. ones. Plus the fact that you have this shared Roman past yeah. in most of those regions. And we have a lot of this information coming not exclusively, but coming from Roman and ancient Greek writers. Yeah. Which, of course, means in Muslim areas, they also had access to all of that information. And, of course, because the Muslims definitely had the desire to build upon the knowledge of the ancients in their own medical schools, for example, in Toledo, they probably had even more of a knowledge about the capabilities of some of these substances like honey. They may not have done the, well, you know, hey, that seems to work. We don't know why, but we'll just keep using it because it seems to work. They may actually have had some more ideas about the why behind the use. Oh, I would agree with that too. 
We know that the Islamic sources are are very, very rich when it comes to medical knowledge, definitely, yes. especially. Um, Which is we... one of the reasons why when we're taking a look, for example, at crusading records, chronicles, and information, literary sources from an Islamic authorship, we do tend to see that there are some extremely detailed descriptions of the medical care. They don't say we're using honey in this, unfortunately. That would have been <laughs> fantastic if I had been able to find that. But they do, in fact, spell out very, very specifically what kind of treatment was used for certain kinds of conditions and wounds. I mean, there were some really horrific wounds that are described in some of those chronicles. And dutifully, they say, well, this is how it was done. This is how it was fixed. And this is how this person was stitched up and whether or not that person survived. Yes. And I was going to come back to this because it's a great story. One of the examples from England that talks about honey and very nasty wounds and how you fix them is the story of Prince Hal and the arrow. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, you have to feel for him because he was a 16-year-old having this absolutely horrific facial wound that he sustained in the Battle of Shrewsbury in 1403. This is in the context of some Welsh rebellion, and he was helping his father, Henry IV, lead the English army, and he ended up taking an arrow in his face. Oof. Yes. Now, to which side of the nose he sustained this injury is uh, something that has been written about by one of my colleagues, Mike Livingston, and he argued that based on the portrait that we see of Henry V later in life, which is the, the one that is not a kind of an oblique angle or three quarters view, it's, it's profile, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. that was done to hide a particularly ugly scar that was on the other side of his face. So according to, to Michael, that arrow was on the right side of Prince Hal's nose, although in the treatise that we have, which goes into quite a lot of particular detail about what happened and how was this arrow had removed and what happened as the prince was healing, how long it took, what kind of medications were used for this. The author, a surgeon named John Bradmore, who was in fact a royal surgeon to the king, he made a comment that it was on the left. Well, the argument, of course, is that it was on John Bradmore's left, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not the prince's left. But in this battle, the prince either didn't have his visor down, didn't have his helmet on, and this arrow was able to lodge itself far back into his head, as John Bradmore says, to a depth of six inches. <sighs> okay, That means that it wasn't right in the front part of the prince's face, but it had actually pierced through some of the bone and the cartilage and everything and was actually stuck in the back of his skull in a very delicate area because one wrong move and it could sever nerves, it could affect the brain stem, it could affect all of his sinuses, everything, you know, his optic nerves. So this was a very, very dangerous and very delicate operation that had to be done. This is the heir apparent. You can't lose him. So that's why all of the specialists came in and everybody was trying to figure out just how were they going to remove this arrowhead. The arrow itself, you know, the shaft of the arrow had come out in part because it took some time. It took a few days while the prince has this arrow sticking out of his face before John Bradmore even had the opportunity to see him. And during that time, the wound in his face had, in fact, gotten infected, not to discuss you or anything, but, you know, we're talking pus, mm -hmm. and it loosened the hole 
that the arrow had made so that the shaft was able to be removed. But the arrowhead is still stuck in the back. And that's the big problem. How do you remove the arrowhead? Some of these physicians who were very highly regarded were, of course, talking about using different kinds of potions or, or other remedies that might help loosen the arrowhead and bring it out. But it was John Bradmore who figured out that what he needed to do was, in fact, create a new instrument a new kind of pliers to work that arrowhead loose from the bone and draw it out of the wound. Remember, six inches. That's quite a deep wound. And of course, the big problem is how do you even get to the arrowhead? This particular set of pliers were not something that were just lying around. John Bradmore himself had to devise them. He had to invent them for this particular issue. But then how do you get the instrument to the wound? Well, what he ended up doing was having to enlarge the wound gradually. So he did them with wooden dowels that were covered in linen and soaked in honey, hence the connection with the honey. Mm -hmm. um, and each one of these dowels was increasingly wider and longer than the last. So gradually he was able to enlarge the wound. Now remember, the only anesthesia we really are using at this time is alcohol. So imagine the agony of that poor prince <sighs> as he's undergoing this, right? Eventually the wound was deep enough, it was wide enough that Bradmore was able to use these tongs that he had devised to extract the arrowhead. And essentially what happened is there was a screw part in the center that wedged itself on the inside of the arrowhead, the part that would have been attached to the shaft of the arrow. And then working it free with the tongs firmly inside the arrowhead, he was able to draw the arrowhead out. Now, the big problem, of course, is if you have a deep wound and you just put like a bandage or something over the top, you risk having an abscess form if the wound heals on the surface, but not all the way in the deep tissue. Mm -hmm. So John Bradmore knew that he needed to ensure that the wound healed from the inside out. So in order to do that, he had to keep the wound open on the surface. Again, using in this case, pads of linen soaked in an ointment that included various things like barley and breadcrumbs and honey. So to keep it, as we would know now, very antibacterial, it would ensure that there was you know, no problem with any kind of infection setting in because the honey is there to prevent the bacteria from developing. So, you know, as the wound is healing, he takes these pads and he shortens them as needed as the wound heals. And he ultimately is saying in his treatise that after about three weeks, the wound was completely cleansed. And then he made sure that the surface of the wound, the skin, was able to heal appropriately. So, you know, all in all, we're talking about a month where the prince is having to undergo this very delicate, very dangerous, and very extensive surgery. But, you know, I was thrilled to see how important honey was. Yes. In this successful surgery. Now, regardless of what earlier historians and scientists had said in antiquity, that honey was supposed to help facial wounds and scarring. Mm -hmm. Well, as we know, because of the portrait, he was going to have a particularly disfiguring scar that he didn't want to have shown in his portraits. 
So we don't necessarily know exactly what that scar must have looked like, but because the wound had to get enlarged in order for Bradmore to get the instrument into the wound, it had to have been a fairly large wound. And I'm sure there was significant scarring. Oh, Ooh, what a story. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not the kind of story that we have a lot of examples of, you know, of its kind in the record. So when we have something like this, that really in huge detail provides the step-by-step methods, including instruments and ingredients for the medical ointments that a surgeon is using, it's such a rich resource. And obviously I wish we had a lot more of these kinds of detailed stories. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of details, I'm pretty sure that that chronicle of this has a picture of the instrument, doesn't it? Isn't it drawn in there? What this, yes, what it this is. instrument looked yes. like? Yeah. And if you go to Shrewsbury today, they have a, a neat little museum by the battlefield, including uh, a little mannequin of Prince Hal with an arrow sticking out of the face. And there is a replica of this set of tongs that Bradmore created right there in the museum. <laughs> that is definitely going to be on everyone's bucket list from here on, I think. But well, you're I right. So. I, it was raining and it was a real mud pit when I was there, but it was certainly worth the, the little trip out there. Oh, for sure. Well, and as you say, the story has has such specific detail about how you would actually use honey, like you'd soak linen in it, and then you'd put it in the wound. So not just on top of it. And it really gets at what it was used for, as you say, it's like binding or uh, antibacterial. And it's, it's a really great example of what we imagined they must have used on the field as well, probably not in such such delicate circumstances, but it gives us a glimpse, which we might not yes. otherwise have had. Now, there are other mentions of surgery where honey is, in fact, talked about. Not necessarily surgery that one would find on a battlefield, but, you know, potentially. You know, sort of like in this case, you would want to use honey, including if you have a head wound that exposes the dura matter. Oof. apparently one of the recommendations was that you could even put honey on that. Hmm. But remember, it helps to seal. Think of the viscous nature of honey. It's hmm. going to stay put. It's going to help keep that wound clean and prevent any kind of microbes from developing. And it's going to stay there because it's viscous. I imagine that's probably why they talked about it being good, good for scars as well, because it keeps the wound moist and that way yes. you don't have as much scarring. Exactly. <laughs> Which is very, very useful. Um, are there other things that you've seen that you've noticed that normally go with honey when you find it in stores? No, the, the one problem with finding in the accounts, these relatively random entries for honey is that it seems fairly isolated. You know, you don't see them collected with a bunch of different kinds of spices that one might think, oh, that, that would make sense, either for a consumption perspective or even in a medical sense, because very often honey was the foundation for a substance that one would use, but it had a lot of other things added to it. And honey was not the only item that was used for cleansing wounds and washing them. We hear that wine was used a lot also. And especially the, there are lots of mentions of old wine. So you might think, oh, like vinegar, you know, wine vinegar. So things that even today, alcohol, well, sure they had alcohol, those are also being used for medical uses, but also for consumption. So honey fits into that category where you almost have to think, all right, in what context was it being used here? Because its use was so multifaceted. Mm -hmm. It could be used for so many different things. 
the use of honey in a medical context was much broader than we would think today. I mean, uh, of course, we don't necessarily on a day to day basis think of honey being used medically. That's usually done in hospitals. But in the Middle Ages, there was a lot more fluidity of spices and other things that one would eat, also having much more of those medical properties. Yes. Now, most of my students are blown away when they hear that willow bark. And if you kind of brew a tea out of it, it has the same kind of properties as popping an aspirin. Yeah, yeah. You know, I they love just, that. <laughs> they don't understand that you think of something in the natural world as having the same efficacy in a medical sense as the pills. And we don't know what's really in them. We just are prescribed them by our doctors. <laughs> so, you know, when you think about where honey shows up, you know, they're not mashing up something like salt pork and mixing that with honey <laughs> or a medical use. But that's why it stands out very often because you have these more typical bacon and smoked and salted and dried fish and cheese and wine and beer and lots of grain and then honey, you know, so, you know, trying to figure out like what it would go with. That's the real question. And that's why, especially since the collection of honey was not noted as a regular occurrence. It certainly is not one of the items that is regularly requested for the sustenance of the army by the king. It just comes in in these rather uneven, irregular collections, usually in small amounts. And it just doesn't really seem like it's going for consumption. It's, it's really there, in my mind, for the medical use. And then it's a matter of pairing it. Like, what are they using it for? Now, we don't have any kind of record that says that in the army that accompanied Henry IV and his son, Prince Hal, there was honey in those stores. But he was taken to a castle in order to recover, to recuperate, and also for treatment. They weren't going to deal with healing the prince right there on the battlefield. So they took him someplace more comfortable to a castle where they probably had honey in the stores. They were just able to use that. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, the last thing I was going to ask you is, do you see it? So you're saying that when you have a king that's on campaign, the amount of honey comes in kind of fits and starts. But do you see people stockpiling it before, say, a siege? Or is that something that you think is just normally there for all sorts of purposes? I have not actually seen it getting stockpiled that way. I have seen some provisioning accounts at, for example, Calais, prior to the siege of the English, during which they managed successfully to claim Calais in the 14th century. But then they also used it as a provisioning base after it was in their hands. And so the records of obtaining all sorts of foodstuffs kind of continues in relatively regular ways and honey is no different. So it probably wasn't stockpiled as a, oh no, <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to need tons of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, they probably would have had some in these towns, in these castles, no matter what. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's a matter of replacing it once you are running low rather than we are using this on such a regular basis. Because if we're talking about medical care, it's not the same thing as calculating how much you'll need as far as daily sustenance of food. Mm -hmm. You can count on needing a certain amount of wheat or barley, but you can't necessarily count on having a particular need for medical supplies. I mean, are you going to need them? 
Most likely, but in what amount? And there's the question. That's the big mystery. And you can never plan the same way as you can for how much food are we going to need to support us all. And in a way, that's a good thing. But in another way, frustrating for you as a historian. <laughs> you want to be able to calculate how much honey you need for each bottle. That would be helpful. It would be nice. But of course, you know, whether or not it was used for every single wound, every single cut, every single puncture wound, you know, that's something that we'll never know. We won't really be able to recreate exactly what is happening as far as treating all the wounds on the battlefield. I mean, that's where most of the medical treatment of wounds did take place. Mm -hmm. Obviously, most people are trying to stitch up a laceration or deal with a big bruise or whatever at that time. You know, and, and clearly the biggest concern and the biggest killer is infection. Right. Okay? We understand infection today. They didn't have the same kind of understanding of infection and contagion in the Middle Ages as we have today. They knew that honey worked for certain things. They didn't necessarily know why. But perhaps the extent to the infection that killed so many people could be another indication of how little they truly understood why honey worked or even who has access to it. And you might wonder, is it a magical substance that is always going to deal with infection successfully? No, <laughs> but it's going to give you much more of a fighting chance. I mean, maybe Richard the Lionheart would have had a different et. Yeah. Um, if if his wound didn't get so badly infected. Right? Yes. I don't know if he put honey on it or not, but <laughs> you know, it, it may or may not have even changed the outcome. Yes. Yeah. But I mean hindsight. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, that that is perhaps one of the dangers of historians, right? That we're all blessed with hindsight. <laughs> and the point is to try to make the hindsight not come in the way of doing good history. Yes. Yes. Well, I think that what you've come to on the honey front makes a lot of sense. And I'm so glad that you were able to talk to us about this today. I think that in the future, now that people are listening to this, there's going to be stockpiling of honey for the <laughs> zombie apocalypse because we're all going to need it. <laughs> as long as it's sterile. <laughs> that is one of the things. I mean, we talk about raw honey being much better for us as far as you know, health and allergies and everything. But there is always the chance that we're dealing with bacteria in the honey. That's why you don't give it to infants under a year old. Very this true. is why modern medical <laughs> practitioners, when they do use honey, they actually use professionally sterilized honey. So, I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> you know, recommend people running out to the grocery store and just grabbing a whole bunch of honey <laughs> that probably isn't going to be the best solution but... you heard it here first everybody <laughs> trust <laughs> trust your doctors well thank you so much alana it's thank been awesome to talk me. to you it's been a pleasure to chat with you it's, it's always good to talk to you thank you so much thank you for more of Ilana's work, you can search for Ilana Krug on academia.edu. That's I-L-A-N-A-K-R-U-G. Her article on honey in the military is called The Wounded Soldier, Honey and Late Medieval Military Medicine, and you can find it in Wounds and Wound Repair in Medieval Culture, published by Brill. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net. What's on the website this week, Peter? Hi, Danielle. Yeah, we've got a few things. Uh, first, I guess we should talk about a piece I uh, just posted onto the website. It's about the medieval history of flying. 
There were attempts at uh, taking flight in the Middle Ages. Some did not work very well, but there are others that had some success. So uh, I, I think I have a piece I've been working on for a little bit, and uh, I'm glad to have it out on the website. Uh, so you can read that. And you also, if you're interested in nail binding, it's a kind of uh, weaving art famous with like, the Vikings. Uh, there's a piece on that as well on the site. So those are you can see on medievalist.net. Thanks, Peter. Ilana Krug is one of several people on the podcast, including me, who has written articles for Medieval Warfare magazine. And guess what? People who subscribe to the podcast on Patreon at the $5 and $10 levels get a digital or paper subscription to Medieval Warfare, so they're always the first ones in the know. If you'd like to get on board, visit patreon.com slash medievalists. To learn how to fly like a medieval person, or just to read all about it, you can visit Medievalists.net or follow along on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. And if you're interested in seeing what I'm up to, you can follow me, Danielle Sabolsky, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. You can even find my books on Amazon. As always, our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thank you for being sweet enough to listen. Have yourself a wonderful day. 